all go ahead and stand together if you'd like. Just picking your way in. Come on in. It's great to see you. I'm just going to sing to the Lord. Let's him up this morning. Come to the light. Come to the living water. It never runs dry. You can trust the Father. He's good. And he's satisfied. Come to the light. The empty shadow, trade the night. You can trust the Father, He is good and He satisfies. Send His Son, Jesus, to be amazing.
Just a legend of old In the middle of the darkness There is no moment I'm alone Your love can't be outdone A love that you never withhold Constant, always with me. In your presence, I am whole. You never let go, never let go, never let go. You pull me in close, pull me in close, pull me in close. You never let go, never let go, never let go. You pull me in Pull me in close, pull me in close. You never let go of me, Jesus. I will rest in you. You're my peace, you are my refuge. the shelter of your wings, God. You're the promise I hold on to. You never let go, never let go, never let go. You pull me in close, pull me in close, pull me in close. You never let go, never let go, never let go. You pull me in close. 
surrounding me, let it break, at your name, still, call the sea to still, raging me to still. Shadows. 
Jesus, it's in your name that, that we've gathered together today. It's in that precious and powerful name that we are able to come before your throne, to be received to you. It's only because of who you are and, and what you've done. Lord, the authority you possess over all things. Lord, the at your name, darkness itself, it, it, it trembles, it cannot stand before you. And so, Lord, it's in your name that we've gathered together today. It's your name that we have come to declare and celebrate and lift up. We rejoice in you, God. We honor you today. We magnify you. We lift you up. Lord, would you be more and more famous within our, our heart and, Lord, all throughout this church and this community and beyond. Lord, only you have the power to save. Only you have the power to heal. Only you have the power to transform. So we call out to you today. We call upon your name today. And Lord, it's our, our joy this morning to worship you, not only through singing songs, but also through giving our tithes, our offerings to you. And so, Lord, uh, this morning as we prepare to give, uh, would you receive these gifts? We're so thankful for all that you've given us, all that you've blessed us with. And Lord, would you receive what we give now? We pray it in that powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, go ahead and take a seat in a moment. Uh, our ushers are going to come and receive our offering. Uh, if you're a guest visiting or your first time here, uh, don't feel as if you have to give. This is a time for our church family uh, to give. But we're going to continue to sing and worship and spend time in the presence of the Lord.
can hardly think as you go deeper still as you go deeper still as you go thanksgiving and gratitude. You are such a good father toward us, a good God towards us. Psalm 95 said, you, says you, Lord, are a great God, a great king above all. And Lord, we know that in this earthly life, there is no guarantee that things will be perfect that there will be no trials or difficulties. In fact, you, you've said that, that we will face trials and hardships, but Lord, you are still a good God. You still see us and know us and love us. You still have called us to yourself. You have still extended your grace towards us despite our sin and shortcomings and failings. You've still given your mercy new every morning. You have your arms open towards us to receive us. Lord, you have called us into your family as the children of God. You're preparing a home for us in heaven. Lord, there are so many things we could just celebrate and thank you for. You are so good, so gracious toward us. So we declare that. We sing that aloud. Lord, would that sink deeply into our hearts today. Lord, we ask your, your blessing upon uh, this time today as we continue. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, hey, as we prepare to continue, why don't you take just a brief moment and greet someone nearby, say hello, and then we'll continue. Well, good morning. Welcome. 
Great to see each one of you. Thanks for being here this morning. My name's Matt. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're so glad that you've joined us today to worship the Lord, to study His Word, to be with us in fellowship. If you are new to our church, a special welcome to you, and we have a welcome gift for you if you'd stop by the Welcome Center on your way out. We'd love to give that to you and tell you uh, more about what's going on here at Calvary. A few things that are happening, in fact, uh, for you this uh, next month in August, we are going to host a women's gathering. Uh, This is for the women in the fellowship, obviously. That's why it's called a women's gathering. So uh, we try to be just really clear in our communication. Um, So we're going to have the ladies get together at time of breakfast and kind of spend some time being encouraged in the word, also um, a sharing of a testimony. So um, the last one that we we did, I just heard great things from it, and a lot of women came out and were encouraged and blessed by it. So um, make a note of that, ladies. You can go online, and we'd ask you to register for it just so we can know how much food to prepare. Um, $5 for the cost of the food, but that's going to be a great time, so you don't want to miss it. And then next week, we have a water baptism. So we are so blessed to be able to see people take steps uh, in their journey of Christ um, with water baptism. And uh, we're going to be sharing in that next week after this service, after the 11 a.m. So if you have not yet been water baptized, maybe you've walked with the Lord for many years, and that's just not something that's been a part of your your journey yet. Man, we'd love for you to take that step. Um, We'd love to join with you to celebrate the new life that you have in Christ and that you're walking in. And uh, it's a beautiful thing to participate in that. So sign up online for that, we would ask. So uh, you can go to calvary.com and, and, and uh, find the baptism link there. And, uh, and then for those of you that have been baptized and want to encourage those folks that are going to be doing that, just plan on staying and hanging out a little bit longer after service next week and joining in that celebration. And then last thing we wanted to mention, we mentioned this last week, but as we're gearing up for our life groups quarter, uh, we are going to be hosting just a quick little interest meeting for those that are maybe interested in leading or hosting this quarter. And you may be even brand new to our church, but you've participated in life group ministries or small group ministries in the past. Would you join us for just a quick interest meeting? We're going to be on a couple tables outside of the grill after service, myself and Chesley Monzo, and we'd love to sit down with you. We've got kind of an, an info sheet that we'd hand you and walk through with you um, just so you can kind of get an understanding of what maybe leading or hosting would entail. So um, as you're praying about it, thinking about it, we'd love to have you be a part of that meeting right after service. All right. Well, that's it for this time. Let's go ahead and um, study God's word. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We're going to be studying the Bible. We'd love to have you look at it with your own eyes. And also, if you don't own a Bible, take one of these home as a gift from us. All right. Pastor Jeff needs a Bible. I noticed he didn't bring one in. Pastor Jeff over here, he needs a Bible. (laughs) Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. Hey, let's uh, turn in our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 11. There you go. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate that. It's just always good to look into the Word of God, Jeff. Okay. (laughs) You can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11 and... Also, if you just put your thumb there and turn to James chapter 1, we're going to get started uh, in James chapter 1 in just a, just a moment. Actually, speaking of Pastor Jeff, uh, years ago he gave me some really good advice. Uh, it was uh, about 10 years ago when I was getting started, or 11 years ago when I was getting started uh, as the senior pastor of this church. He said to me, he said, you know, it's a good idea if you can to take as much of a chunk of the vacation that is allotted to you at once as a lead pastor of a church because it's just good to be able to let your brain reset and have enough time to go by where you get really recharged for the preaching and teaching ministry that you're about to enter into. And I've listened to him ever since then. So uh, we're actually, my family and I, going to be taking off tomorrow uh, for Lake Tahoe, which we've been, I think, doing for 12 years or something like that at this point. And we're going to just uh, be together, kind of get refreshed, get recharged for the next kind of ministry calendar uh, year. So I wanted to start this off by not just gloating that I get to go, <laughs> go to Lake Tahoe tomorrow, but I wanted to give you guys the teaching schedule over the next few weeks. Tuesday nights for the Tuesday night Bible study, I had mentioned this last week that I was going to teach via video tomorrow or on a Tuesday night this week. 
Uh, but I prepared the teaching and was getting ready to go teach it. And I just, there was kind of a, I just had this impression, like, I just really don't want to teach this teaching to a camera. So uh, this Tuesday night, Pastor Mike Casey is going to teach James chapter 2. So I'd encourage you to come out for that. And then the following Tuesday, uh, Pastor Jeff is going to teach James chapter 3. And then the following Tuesday, uh, Pastor Joshua Shively, our youth minister, he's going to teach James chapter 4. All right, so uh, that'll be the Tuesday night uh, study, and then first Tuesday in August, we'll be back in 1 Corinthians. I'll teach 1 Corinthians chapter 10, maybe 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, we'll see. And then for Sundays, um, today we're going to be looking at 2 Samuel chapter 11, the episode with David and Bathsheba, and so if you know the story of the life of David, you know what that's about. So uh, the next two Sundays, Pastor Matt is going to teach the first one, and then Pastor Jeff the second one. Pastor Matt is going to teach uh, Psalm 51. Uh, 51, do I get that right? 51, and, and that is what David prayed when God convicted him of his sin. And then Pastor Jeff is going to teach Psalm 32, and that is God, God restoring David back into his uh, rightful place and in a right relationship with him. So we're going to kind of look at the episode today and then get a behind the, the curtain view into what was happening in his heart personally before God uh, the next couple of weeks. And then the third week, my friend Andy Dean, who is the pastor who leads Calvary Chapel Bible College in Southern California, he's taught here before. He's a great teacher, great pastor, great man. And he, one of the, <clears throat> I think he might have more than one book written. So I know he's written a book about uh, the Bible, Bible study methods. And so I asked him to come and to teach us as a church about how to read our Bibles personally and just kind of get some skills, gain some skills in personal Bible study and in personal uh, Bible reading. So that'll be uh, the third week, and then I'll be back uh, with you guys. So I just wanted you to know that. Some guys like to just kind of like sneak away and just leave. And uh, I'm tempted to do that, but I like to tell you, you know, what's coming over the next uh, few weeks. All right, so that's the deal. So let's pray. Oh, and also, I'm turning 40 on Tuesday. <laughs> Happy birthday to me. Yes. <laughs> getting up there, getting up there. So, so many people in the church have, you know, been here from the time that I started when I was in my late 20s. I was 29, and, you know, I was almost 30 years old. And so some of you have been able to, you know, be with me during my 30s. And if you have, I thank you for enduring that. <clears throat> and I hope that my 40s are better for you than, uh, than my 30s were. Okay, let's, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us in his word. Lord, we thank you so much for your holy scripture. And uh, we are just so glad, Lord, to have you speak into our hearts and to give us your truth. And as we look at, Lord, what is, you know, really a dark moment in David's life, we pray, Lord, that it would not be wasted. But Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. We thank you for your great redemption, that you would take a great failure in this man's life, a man who, at the end of the day, in his heart of hearts, he really did love you. But you took this failure, and we thank you, Lord, that you did not decimate him with it, you did not end him with it, but Lord, that you even used his failure and subsequent reconciliation for your honor and glory, including even today, Lord this morning, that we would hear you from this passage and really learn, God, from your word. So we thank you. We pray that you'd help us and that you'd speak to us. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, looking in James chapter 1, uh, James gives an outline for the process that follows temptation. I, 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 one misnomer that a lot of believers have is that temptation in and of itself is a sin. Temptation is common to man. Everybody's going to experience temptation. Jesus experienced temptation. The Bible says in Hebrews that he was tempted at all points as we are yet without sin. So temptation is not the issue. It's what happens with that temptation. What do we do with that temptation? And James chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, outlines the process of, following temptation that leads to sin. It says, let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person 
is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Right? So that's the temptation. It's appealing to desire. Then desire, verse 15, when it has conceived, that's the next step, the conception, the thinking about, the uh, enjoying, the fantasy. When it has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So you see temptation occurring, the conception of sin occurring, sin occurring, the actual living out the conception, and then the full-grown nature of sin in uh, James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15. The reason that I read that to you, partly is so we could understand the process, but it's also because David is going to follow that exact process in the story that we're about to read. Uh, he is going to see something that will connect to the desire within. He's going to experience temptation. He's going to conceive in his mind of what he could do in response to that desire, in response to that temptation. And then a sin, since it's been conceived, is going to be born from his life. But it's not going to stop there. That sin that is born is going to continue to compound and grow to the point that it becomes fully grown, like James says, and brings forth death. And we're going to actually see not just spiritual death take place here, but literal death in this story in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now, uh, normally the way that I teach is I, I read a few lines and uh, develop the thought that's there and then make a point, and then we'll read a few more lines, develop the thought, and make a point. Today what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you, read with you the whole story, all of 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'll make a few clarifying comments as we go through the whole story. I want you to see the whole thing, what happened. And it really isn't even the whole thing because chapter 12 is also part of this story. But we're just going to look at chapter 11 today. So we'll see the whole thing, make a few clarifying comments. And then, and don't be scared by this next thing I'm about to say, I'm going to make 10 points or observations from the text, 10 lessons. So I'll speak about each one of them very uh, quickly and clearly. So if you're a note-taking person, get your Get your pen ready for these uh, 10 different things. But first, let's read the story together, the word of the Lord. It says in verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 11, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. So the weather would permit in the spring. That's when battles would be fought. David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. So the armies of Israel went out into battle. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. We saw the Ammonites last week in our study in 2 Samuel chapter 10. They attacked David. David is now finishing the job. But, verse 1, David remained at Jerusalem. So he stayed. Uh, it was not his normal practice, but he stayed. It happened, very dramatic note there in verse 2, late one afternoon when David ar arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Now, scholars, teachers, Bible teachers, pastor teachers have tried to discern whether this woman was... Uh, complicit in David's sin or whether she was innocent uh, in David's sin in this particular moment. And people come down on both sides of things. The reality is the Bible doesn't say. It doesn't say what the configuration of the buildings were, where, whether David was looking for this and, and she would have not known that he was watching, whether she was trying to put herself in view of David or something like that. The Bible just doesn't say. Bathsheba is never condemned in Scripture uh, straightforwardly though that doesn't necessarily lead to a conclusion because there are plenty of sins in the Bible that are recorded but not specifically condemned later. You know, so-and-so did this, and then later someone mentions, and that was a sin. You just kind of read of it and are to come to your own conclusion. And David, verse 3, sent and inquired about the woman. Uh, so rather than running to a friend, hey, I saw something I shouldn't have seen, he inquired about her. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So 
Her identity is now given. Her name is Bathsheba. She has an important grandfather. She, her dad is named Eliam. That means that her grandfather was a man named Ahithophel, who was David's counselor, so older than David, David's counselor. His granddaughter is Bathsheba. And she is the wife of a man named Uriah the Hittite, who was one of David's mighty men. So one of his supreme or chief soldiers, this is his wife. So David, verse 4, sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now, she had been, we have a little parenthetical thought, she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. And then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Now, for us, when we read that line in the parentheses, she'd been purifying herself from her uncleanness. It might not mean a lot to you initially when you read it, but what that means in ancient Israel, uh, the Israelite women in the law of God, the ceremonial law of God, after their monthly period, they would go through a cleansing process, a cleansing ceremony. So she had just gone through that. That helps the reader understand she's definitely not pregnant. So this is, this is not Uriah's child, this is David's child. That's kind of the idea that we're to glean from that reading. So David sent word to Joab. Joab's the general of his army. He said, send me Uriah the Hittite. Again, he's a warrior for David. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, verse 7, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. This is just like a disgusting detail there. David is trying to get uh, Uriah to go home to enjoy his wife sexually so he can blame the pregnancy on Uriah. But Uriah, verse 9, slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said, verse 11, the ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths or tabernacles or tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in an open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. The reader is meant to feel that Uriah has all the honor that David should have had. David stays home during the battle. Uriah comes home at the invitation of the king, and he says, the ark's in a tent. Israel's out camping. The men of Israel in war, they're out camping. They're in tents. Joab's in tents. There's no way that I'm going to come home and enjoy the privilege of my bride when these guys are out at war, this is wartime, I should be out there. I'm not going to do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, verse 12, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk. This was like the plan of David, intoxicate the man, try to lower his inhibitions. And the evening... And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Even a drunken Uriah has self-control in this moment, is what we're supposed to glean. And in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab. His plan had failed, and he sent it by the hand of Uriah, obviously sealed, so Uriah would not have read it. And in the letter, he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting. And then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. This is pure wicked. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah, verse 16, to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting. And he instructed the messenger, so this is Joab now speaking to the messenger that will go to David. He says, when you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then if the king, king's anger rises and if he says to you, why did you 
go so near the city to fight, did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerubbesheth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then Joab said to his servant, you shall say, you know, to the king, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So Joab anticipates that the messenger is going to give the report of the battle, and he anticipates David's response. What are you doing? Why are the archer, archers killing all these uh, soldiers? You shouldn't have been so near the wall. Have you not read the book of Judges when Gideon's son Abimelech got too close to the wall of the city of Thebes, and an old woman, it says in the book of Ju uh, Judges, took a millstone and just tossed it over the edge, and it just killed him down below. Haven't you read the Bible, you know, is kind of the, the thing that Joab is anticipating. So he tells his servant, if he says that, say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also, then he'll understand. So, verse 22, the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab, Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, the men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then, the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. It seems like this, the messenger didn't wait for David to respond. He just gets out with it. You know, Uriah's dead. David said to the messenger, verse 25, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Very dismissive from David, like he's saying, such is life. This is how it works. People die. Uh, the sword devours one now and, 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 and now another. And, and so he says, strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. And the instruction of the messenger, encourage him. And when the wife of Uriah, verse 26, heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, the customary time of weeping for her husband was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The first thing I want to point out to you of these 10 lessons, I think, that come out of this text, and I'm sure there's many more. But number one is this. Sin is often cultivated over long years. Sin is often cultivated over long years. There's a lot of things as we've been going through the life of David this year that we really like about David, right? This is not one of them, obviously. But there are many things that we like. You know, when Samuel the prophet comes to his house and anoints him with the oil and declares him to be the next king in Israel. And God rejects the outward appearance of his brothers but looks into the heart. We love that, little 16-year-old David. You know, when David uh, has, as he cares for his father's sheep, the lion come or the bear come and he gets bold and courageous and goes out and kills a lion or kills a bear with his bare hands, we like that part about David. When Goliath is taunting Israel and David responds, who's this Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? We like that David, the boldness, the, the confidence in God. We like his friendship with Jonathan. We like the way that he held it all together when Saul persecuted him and chased him into the wilderness, when he wouldn't take matters into his own hands. We like the songs that he wrote, the psalms that he wrote, the prayers that he prayed to God. There are so many things that we love about David. We followed him at this point from his teenage years to today where he's about 50 years old. And all in between, age 16 to 50 years old, it's like, man, we, we love this guy. But there's been one thing, if you're like me, there's been one thing over the course of time in David's life that though I love so much, and though I look into the Word and see that David was a man after God's own heart, that is God's declaration of David, both in the book of Acts and in 1 Samuel, and I agree with it as I read it, there's this one thing that just continually seems off in David's life. And it has been over the course of time in his life that he has acquired wives for himself. 
I mean, we've seen that from the moment that he became of marrying age, he began to accumulate more wives. He was a polygamist. Now, in his culture and in his time, there apparently weren't people willing to rise up and rebuke him for that. Some of that might have just been cultural. People looked around at the culture, they saw that there were other polygamists, and in the culture in those days, many of them embraced it or received it. Received it. Some of them might have looked at other kings and said, well, this is what kings do. But God had specifically said to the kings in his law, the future kings, kings that weren't even yet when he wrote it in the book of Exodus, that they should not accumulate wives for themselves. And David had done that thing. He had committed that crime. Some of my, might have even dismissed it by saying, well, he was building partnerships with nations and people groups around him by intermarrying and marrying you know, princesses and prominent figures and stuff like that. But still, even with excuses like that, to the modern reader, it feels odd. There's all this beautiful stuff in David's life, but that, you can tell, man, there's a problem. And it appears now that that problem has caught up with David in his life. That sin was cultivated over long years. You would have hoped at this point in David's life, at 50 years of age, that he would have said, you know, I am prone to all sins because I'm a human being, but there are particular sins that I feel a weakness towards, a pull towards. He should have known this about himself. In fact, there's a law in the Old Testament, it will be odd to us, but it will make sense, a law in the Old Testament that sort of highlighted this kind of idea. It, it concerned the ownership of oxen in ancient Israel. And the rule was that if you had an ox, that one day, for the first time ever, gored a human being, a, you know, your neighbor or something like that, just kind of went nuts, you know, the ox had a bad day, and, you know, attacked somebody, then your response, what you were supposed to do is to take that ox and you were supposed to kill them. You were supposed to put that animal down. But the law also said that if you had an ox that had previously behaved that way and you had not put that animal down, and it, again, a second time or a third time or another time attacked a person, then the law said the ox should be put down, but so should the owner if the person the ox has attacked has died. In other words, they are it is, it is as if they are guilty of manslaughter or murder because they knew of the previous behavior. David, the principle there is that what has happened before should be an indicator of what you need to protect yourself from today. And David should have known of this tendency in his life. It had been cultivated, like I said, over long years. Now, number two, if I could just keep moving through this together with you. Number two, we must remain engaged in the fight of the kingdom. We must remain engaged in the fight of the kingdom. Notice there in verse one, it says at the end of verse one, it's a very ominous phrase, but David remained at Jerusalem. And everybody else went out to fight. These were God's wars. This was God's fight. This was for the people of God, the people of Israel. There was a war to wage. And David neglected that war. He's not a young man at this point. Like I said, he's middle-aged. He's 50 years old. He's not a young, passionate youth. But in his older years, he says, man, it's time for me to kick back a little bit. You know, I've been king for 20 years at this point. It's time for me to rest. It's time for me to relax. It's time for me to pull back from the war. Now, it might have been important for David to no longer be on the front lines with a sword in his hand, but he still should have been out there as a consultant or as an officer or as a moral or emotional or spiritual leader of the people of Israel. But instead, he made a decision to stay home. He disengaged from the fight and it cost him and the people of Israel greatly. You know, one of, the, one of the best ways to keep yourself walking on that narrow path, through that narrow gate, on that difficult way, one of the, one of the safest ways to keep doing that is to continue 
to engage in the war, in the battle that the Lord has called you to. To to not become a person that is tired of your God-given responsibility. You see, I believe that believers are safer in the battle and in the fight than they are when they withdraw from it and begin to neglect the responsibilities that God has given to them. Paul said in Ephesians 6, verse 13, that we're to take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Paul's mentality wasn't run from the evil day, but put on the armor and engage yourself in the fight. And if you want to do well spiritually for a long time, for many decades, one of the things that we must do is we must plug in We can't tune out from the work of God, but we we must plug into it. Some of you would be so greatly helped in your spiritual life by just simply serving the Lord, just beginning to volunteer yourself, give yourself to the mission of the Lord, the making of disciples, mentoring people that are coming up after you. But David pulled himself from that fight, focused upon himself, maybe began to think, hey, these are times for semi-retirement, kicking back a little bit. But that's when he got into serious trouble. Number three, success comes with temptation. Success comes with temptation. Now, really, that sentence, you could say it with anything comes with temptation. Failure comes with temptation. Youth comes with temptation. Old age comes with temptation. Everything you go through comes with temptation. But there are unique temptations that occur when a person experiences success in their life. And I hope you've noticed over the last few weeks as we've gone from 2 Samuel chapter 2 all the way through 2 Samuel chapter 10 that David has been successful I mean, he became the king of Judah. They wanted him to be king. Seven and a half years, he led the people of Judah. Then at 37 years of age, all of Israel wanted him to be their king. And he becomes a king, and he's very successful. Every people group that attacks them, he wins a victory against them. God had promised Abraham that from the Nile River to the Euphrates, the people of Israel would dwell in that land, and they never yet had taken it, but David was expanding that territory. David was being and operating as a successful man. But with success, with fruit, with even the blessing of God upon our lives, there is a temptation, and the temptation is to forget about God because of the success. Moses, I don't know if you know this, but Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, it's really just a record of three sermons that Moses preached. He was 120 years old at that point, and he knew because God told him that he was going to die and that he would not go into the promised land with the people of Israel. Joshua would go in with them. So Moses preached some sermons to everybody before he died. How many of you think that if, I mean, just imagine it. 120 years old, so he's got a lot to say. But he knows he's going to die and that they're going to go into the the promised land. I mean, this has got to be like his best sermon. And we know that it, it, it was pretty incredible because it found its way into the Word of God. And in his sermon, listen to what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. He said, Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. You see, Moses foresaw a day where the people of Israel would go into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, which is another way of saying lots of livestock and lots of agriculture. You know, livestock is uh, multiplying and fruit is abounding. Milk and honey. And in that land, he said, you're going to build houses, you're going to be doing well, God is going to bless you, but there's a danger in that success, he said. And the danger is that in that moment, your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. If that 
sermon from Moses is not a warning for believers living in the United States of America. I don't know what is. I mean, it's a warning that says, look, when times are good, when you got a roof over your head, you got clothes on your back, you got a paycheck rolling in, in times like that, beware lest you forget the Lord, and even worse, lest you say to yourself, my own hand has provided this. My own hand has provided this. I heard a pastor recently quote Bart Simpson, uh, so I'm blaming this other pastor But he talked about an episode of The Simpsons where at Thanksgiving dinner, Bart Simpson was asked to pray, and he said, God, we bought this food with our own money, so thanks for nothing. You see, that is the spirit that sometimes can come upon a person who forgets the Lord. Success comes with temptation, and David had great success. And in that moment in his life, there was a unique danger. There's danger at all times, but a unique danger that he would forget the Lord. Number four, if I could move on here, he says, uh, uh, number four, uh, the eye gate requires constant tending. The eye gate requires constant tending. Now, David is there. It says in verse two, he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. There were desires within. He was a man. He would naturally be attracted to her and what he saw. And like I mentioned earlier, we don't know if this was an accidental thing that occurred or whether David was, you know, being a creeper at this moment and was looking for something to see. We don't really know. But either way, his desires within were activated when he saw what he saw. And in that moment, he needed to take care of his heart. You see, it says in 1 John chapter 2 that everything in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life are not from the Father, but are from the world. There's a thing called the desires of the eyes. There are certain temptations that are activated with what we see, and it's not just sins towards lust, like here in this chapter. It can be seeing wealth. It can be you know, seeing success in someone else, a blessing of God upon someone else's life, can be a lot of different things that a person would see. But the eye gate requires constant tending. You know, in the book of Job, Job was defending himself to his friends who were bringing accusations against him, and Job was defending his own character for a moment. And in the process of doing that, it's interesting because he described the way he walked with God. This is so helpful to us. You know, how do you do it? How do you walk with the Lord? Job described how he walked with the Lord. And one of the things that he said is fascinating. Job 31, verse 1. Listen to this. He says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Now, when Job said that, what he is not announcing is, hey, there was this moment in my life where I realized that that can be a temptation to look lustfully at a young woman. So what I did is I just went into the wiring of my brain and I found the switch, you know, that would desire that or would notice beauty. And I just turned that switch off. I did that. That's what I did. And I closed the door and now I no longer would ever experience that temptation. No, what he's saying is I made a covenant about that. I realized that that would be something I would experience, a temptation that I would endure. So I decided to dedicate myself to make sure that I don't enter into that temptation. That when it comes into my life, that it does not have a chance to conceive because I am walking in the light. Because my life is going to, uh, I'm going to throw everything I have into success in that area of my life. I made a covenant, he says, with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. He worked hard at this reality in his life. This would be the kind of spirit or the kind of attitude that a person would have who says, man, I'm going to make sure that the people in my life, if I married my spouse, they're able to see where I've gone 
online. They're able to lock down my phone and my devices, that my time is monitored, the places that I go and visit are monitored. It brings me great joy and great delight to know that each month my wife gets a report along with Pastor Jeff and a few others gets a report stating where I went online or what apps I opened up. That just brings me great joy, great delight. You can do that kind of thing. You can make that kind of covenant with your eyes. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Now when Jesus said that, a couple things you should know, he was speaking with hyperbole, so please don't actually pluck out your eye. But secondly, he was also highlighting the severe response that believers should have in this fight towards sin. And thirdly, he was also pointing out the true cause of sin. You see, if your eye causes you to sin, no, your eye, your hands, your feet have never caused you to sin. You use them to sin. We use them to sin. But it is the heart. This is why it's so important for us to maintain our daily walk and relationship with the Lord because our hearts are prone to wander. Now, if I could move on, and number five, I would say it this way. At its core, sin often plays off as the assertion of a right. At, it, at its core, sin often plays off as the assertion of a right. What do you have here in this story? It's actually very modern and appropriate. Because, I mean, over the last year or so, we've had the Me Too movement, where a lot of stories have been told of men and, and women as well, but mostly men in authority who have leveraged that authority to get something sexually that they desire. They've taken it for themselves. And that is what David is doing. He is a king in Israel. He's accomplished. He's successful. He's spiritual. He's a musician. He's written songs. There's a lot that is attractive about this man. People look up to him, and he uses that respect for his own selfish gain. And as he did, there may have been a sense within his heart, I deserve this. This is my right. This is my position. I'm allowed this. I'm important. Now, you don't have to be the leader of anything to be a person who says, this is my right when entering into sin. I deserve this. I deserve to enjoy this. I deserve to get into this. At its core, sin often plays off as the assertion of a right. Number six, sin begets sin. The compounding nature of sin is treacherous. Did you see that throughout this story? I mean, it just got worse and worse and worse. There was sending his men to go ask, you know, and inquiring, who is this? There was a sending of his messengers to go and bring her to himself. There was the encounter itself. There was then the cover-up of the pregnancy or the attempt a couple of nights with Uriah. There was a sending Uriah to the battlefield to die, and there was the marrying of Bathsheba. It just got worse and worse and worse as the story went on. And that's what sin is like. It begets more sin. It is compounding in its nature, and it, the compounding nature of sin is treacherous for us to experience. You see, some people have this idea of the God of the Bible that he is some kind of cosmic killjoy. And that the reason that he has his laws, his commandments, his statutes for his people is that what he delights in more than anything is our unhappiness. And he looks at our lives and he says, you know, hey, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't, don't, don't walk there. Don't go there. Don't do this. Don't do that. And we think that it's because he is trying to withhold something good from us. A story like this should demonstrate that God does not forbid sin from our lives because he's trying to keep something good from us, but that he forbids sin from our lives because he's trying to keep something deadly from us, something bad from us. 
Number seven, opportunities for confession, though daunting, abound and are better alternatives to continued resistance. You see, all through the story, David had all these chances, didn't he? You know, to just like come out, get clean, be in the light. You know, like after he asked, you know, some of his servants, like, hey, who, you, do you know, like who lives down there? Do you, do you know? You know, after that, he, he could have confessed his sin. He could have gone to those servants and said, you know, the reason I asked you, it was all wrong. And I just got to confess that. Or, or when he sent them to go bring her, she could have arrived and he could have said, this is so wrong of me. I'm confessing this. I'm not going to follow through with this temptation that I'm experiencing. After the pregnancy, after Uriah's night, in the first night, after his second night, you know, when he wrote the letter, when, when news returned, there were all these different off-ramps for David. And look, every single one of them was daunting. It's embarrassing to look at your servants and to say, you know, the only reason I wanted to know who lives down there is because I saw her and was drawn to her, and she's another man's wife off limits to me. I can't believe I did that. Please forgive me. That's daunting. It was daunting at every step of the way. But the reality is, it is better to confess your sin now than to conceal it and wait for later because it only grows worse. That leads to number eight. Sin inevitably impacts multitudinous parties. Now, if you're taking notes, you can just write, sin impacts lots of people. You see that throughout the story, right? It, it impacted Bathsheba, Uriah, her husband, the messengers who had to get involved in this whole thing, Joab, who had to send Uriah out to the front of the battle and withdraw troops, the troops who died fighting next to Uriah in vain, that was pointless, there was no reason for their death. The child that Bathsheba is pregnant with will eventually die. We'll see in chapter 12 as part of God's discipline on David's life. And really what we'll be reading of throughout the rest of 2 Samuel or big portions of 2 Samuel from this point forward are consequences in David's family. There will be chaos that flows because of this moment. And then really, in a sense, wouldn't you say the king of Israel committing a crime like this, it affected all of the nation. Sin inevitably impacts more than just the person committing the sin. It impacts, at times, generations of people. And then, number nine, sin will be found out anyway. That's the whole thing. David's trying to keep it a secret, but it's going to come to the surface. I mean, we're reading the story, so we get to join the narrator with the privilege of, as readers, having omniscience. That's kind of what it's like. Like, we know the whole story. But the people going through it didn't know the story, but they would know the story because, as God said in Numbers 32, verse 23, your sin will find you out. It, it is known. It will be found out anyway. And then finally, number 10. Let me close by saying this. God's grace can summit our mountains of sin. What, what happens from this point forward is the revolutionary and incredible grace of God. Oh, don't get me wrong. David is going to have a life filled with some consequences and some ramifications of what he's done. There's going to be a lot of trust that's been broken. It will take time for that trust to be rebuilt. There will be consequences of not only this sin, but his polygamous relationships in the way that his family, as the children grow, relate to one another. But in the midst of all of that, God still was willing to work. For one, he eventually began to bless the union between Bathsheba and David. I mean, talk about the grace of God. Bathsheba would have a son later in life named Solomon. He would actually be the one that God chose to be the next king in Israel. David had many other sons, but Solomon would be the one that God chose. And through the line of Solomon, Christ came. So Bathsheba 
finds herself in the line of Christ. She's related to the Messiah, an ancestor of Jesus himself. But look, that's not the only way that God's grace is going to flow in response to all of this. Notice what we're doing this morning. We are reading this story, a story that's embarrassing. But wouldn't you say that the story of David and this episode in his life and all the subsequent psalms that he wrote and the visitation of Nathan the prophet and and all of that, wouldn't you say that it's very possible that God has used that same story, that same sin and that same failure to rescue perhaps millions, maybe even billions of believers from the time of the event itself to our modern day because they've interacted with this story. How many men and how many women have read the story of David and said to themselves, man, I got to stay in the battle. How many men and how many women have read this story and said, I might be prone to that, but I'm not going to enter into it. How many men and how many women have run to an accountability partner or someone else and said, look, I don't want to go the way of David. I see what happens there, and I don't want to go in that direction. How many men and how many women have gone where David went or have had someone else in their lives go where David went, yet have seen the grace of have seen the restoration, have seen what true repentance looks like in David's life and have modeled themselves after it and God has restored them. Look, there are a thousand ways that God used this event, not just in David's life, but in our lives as well. God's grace, the cross of Jesus Christ, can summit our mountains of sin. Amen? It says in Romans chapter 5 that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. There is no mountain of our sin that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot get up. His grace can summit our mountains of sin. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up right now. And I'm going to close in prayer. But uh, as I do, let me just say this. You know, I think... Probably any teacher, I'm sure many of you are teachers in one capacity or another, any uh, Bible teacher, pastor, a question that you ask yourself from time to time is, what do I want my listeners to walk away with from this particular teaching, lecture, sermon that I'm giving? And I, I definitely don't want you to, I mean, I think the Holy Spirit, you know, has, has a bunch of different things, so he'll let you walk away with what you need to walk away with, but I definitely don't want you to walk away with a doom and gloom, you know, kind of thing, a feeling of hopelessness. In fact, even this morning, I was getting dressed, and I reached in my closet. I have a black shirt. I I was going to wear a black shirt. I'm like, no, not on David and Bathsheba Sunday. I'm going to put on something a little brighter, you know. True story. But I think one of the biggest takeaways that I want you to have is that sin is deadly, therefore we have got to press into our daily relationship with him. Because you might be recovering from something someone else did to you, you gotta press into your daily relationship with him. You might have had parents that went off and did something like this, you gotta press into your daily relationship with him. You may have done something like this, you gotta press into your daily relationship with him. You might be tempted to do something like this yourself, you gotta press into your daily relationship with him. If there's any takeaway that I want you to have, it's press in to your personal walk with Jesus so that this kind of thing doesn't happen or so that when it does, you can recover from it. Because this right here is just human life that we just read about. So let me pray uh, and lead you all in prayer today. Lord, we, we do pray and ask, Lord God, for your grace, which is sufficient to wash over our hearts. And Lord, would you help us to walk with you, to stand with you, even through valleys like these. We thank you, Lord, that even when a hero like David becomes tarnished, in our mind's eye. You, Lord Jesus, are the hero that never fails. 
you are always good. And we love you this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Let's stand. We'll sing this last song to the Lord this morning. now as we go. Bless your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.